nobody else can change our mind our hearts like how jesus changes our hearts like uh prayer was just sharing you know things that we were comfortable with before we are comfortable with now because jesus has changed our attitude towards certain things we're not comfortable with evil we are coming not comfortable with uh, you know slander gossip there are many things that you know we were comfortable with earlier after christ comes into our life we're not comfortable with it anymore that shows our uh, how much our sensitivity towards sin has increased so this song tells us that nobody else can change my heart but jesus Nobody else could have changed my heart Nobody else could have saved me Picked up the pieces when I fell apart I'm so glad you are the chain You are the one that I love Light of the world sent from above Sing hallelujah, shout to the Lord You are the one, you are the one I love Nobody else could have changed my heart Nobody else could have saved me Picked up the pieces when I fell apart I'm so glad you are the change You are the one that I love Light of the world sent from above Sing hallelujah, shout to the Lord You are the one, you are the one I love You are the one that I love Light of the world sent from above Sing hallelujah, shout to the Lord You are the one, you are the one I, You are the one, you are the one I, You are the one, you are the one I love right. So God is the one who saved us and God is the one who sustains us. I am going to sing it in a high key. It's very, pretty low when I sang it that time. Nobody else could have changed my heart. Nobody else could have seen. Picked up the pieces when I fell apart. I'm so glad you unchanged. You are the one that I love. Light of the world sent from above Sing hallelujah, shout to the Lord You are the one, you are the one I love You are the one that I love Light of the world sent from above Sing hallelujah, shout to the Lord You are the one You are the one I you are the one you are the one I you are the one you are the one I love All right one more song Okay God gives us his peace God gives us hope and love but he gives us so that we would pass it on the peace that god gives to us we have to pass it on to others who are around us it should spread out of us like water like rivers in a desert love also should flow out of us as so rivers of living water flowing like a river flowing out through you and me spreading out into the desert setting all the captives free let it flow through me let it flow through me let the mighty peace of god flow out through me let it flow through me let it flow through me let 
with the mighty peace of God flow out through me. Oh, is flowing like a river, flowing out to you and me, spreading out into the desert, setting all the captives free. Let it flow through me, let it flow through me. Let the mighty hope of God flow out through me. Let it flow through me. Let it flow through me. Let the mighty hope of God flow out through me. Love is flowing like a river, flowing out to you and me. Spreading out into the desert, setting all the captives free. Let it flow through me, let it flow through me. Let the mighty love of God flow out through me. Let it flow through me, let it flow through me. Let the mighty love of God flow me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have given us your wisdom, your word from above. We pray that this word would fill our hearts to overflowing, that it would fill our lives with peace, that it would give our hearts its hope for the future. And Father, it would give us love, to love those who are unloved, unworthy, even those who we don't consider, O oh Lord, as people who are worth loving. Help us, O oh Lord, to have this agape love in our hearts as we, we are children of the living God. Just like how God loves us, help us to love one another. Father, we pray that the peace that passeth all understanding would dwell in our hearts, in spite of all the struggles and storms that we are going through, we pray that the hope that we would, we would live and see Jesus face to face would keep us alive and running faithfully the job that you have entrusted us with. We thank you and praise you for this evening that you have brought us together. Help us to humble ourselves before the word and listen to you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Okay, so welcome once again on the Saturday evening, and we are in the Gospel of Luke. Turn your Bibles to Gospel of Luke, chapter 17, and we're looking at the four marks of a Christian. Okay, if you and I are Christians, then we should be having these four marks. We started out with, uh, I think it was, yeah. We started out with forgiveness. The first mark of a Christian is forgiveness. Second mark of a Christian is, uh, yes, second mark of a Christian is faithfulness. Third mark of a Christian is thankfulness. Okay? Thankfulness. And we come to the fourth mark of a Christian today. Okay? So we started out with the first mark of a Christian being forgiveness. Second mark being faithfulness. Whatever God has entrusted us to do, we have to do it faithfully. Not just one day or two days. Every day we have to consistently be faithful in what God has called us to do. Reading our Bibles, prayer, fellowship. These things should be regular in our lives. Should be, we should be faithful in these things that God has given us. Doing good works for the glory of God. We should be faithful in that. And then we saw that the ten lepers, nine were thankless but one was thankful and Jesus appreciated and, uh, and gave him eternal life. You know? So we are thankful because being thankful enables us to receive more blessings, enables God to bless us even more with things that we, we have not even uh, you know, understood you know, or known previously. So God is great. God is so wonderful 
that uh, when we are thankful, he blesses us even more. And finally, we get to see uh, how a Christian should be with regard to his second coming. Okay, How are we to be with the light that, you know, we know that Jesus is coming soon. So how should we be? How prepared should you and I be? So the fourth mark of a Christian is being prepared for his coming. Being prepared all right so let's read verses 20 right down to 37 okay i'm going to ask um, ajit to read from 20 to uh, 25 no i don't think uh, yeah 20 to 24 ajit will read from 20 to 24 and priyanka will read from 25 to 30 is that okay ashish just disappeared so I'm going to ask two of you to read it. Okay, 20 to 24, okay. and then uh, 24, 25 to 30. Uh, being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, The kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed, nor will they say, Look, here it is, or there. For behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. And he said to the disciples, the days are coming when you will decide to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look there or look here. Do not go out or follow them. For as a lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. Right. Priyanka? But first... He must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day when Lot went out of from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. So will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Okay. So 31 to 34. Again, Ajit. 31 to 34. Um. On that day, let the one who is on the housetop with his goods in the house not come down to take them away. And likewise, let the one who is in the field not turn back. Remember Lord's wife. Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will keep it. I tell you, in that night there will be two in one bed. One will be taken and the other left. Okay. Priyanka, rest of it. 35 37. There, there will be two women grind, grinding together. One will be taken and the other left. And they said to him, Where, Lord? He said to them, Where the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. All right. So, a very strange passage, but it's an answer to a question. Okay, it's an answer to a question. So the, what, what is the question? The question was asked by the Pharisees. Verse 20 says he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come. And he answered and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here or see therefore indeed the kingdom of God is within you. So, you know, uh, when Jesus was here walking on the earth, at that time it was a time period of great expectation, you know. People had this sense of great urgency, like, you know, something is going to happen from Yahweh's side. You know? God is going to do something great. So, uh, you know, people were very faithful in keeping the observance of uh, Passover. They used to travel all the way, whichever country they are living in, they used to faithfully journey uh, towards Jerusalem every year for the Passover. And uh, they, should, they used to attend it with families. So, uh, they, they had this feeling that, Somehow God is going to deliver them from this bondage. The whole of Israel was under bondage of Roman Empire. So they thought that, you know, the political Messiah is going to come and he's going to not only restore them spiritually, but uh, mainly he's going to restore them politically. You know, he's going to make the glory days of Israel come back again 
and they'll be like the days of uh, david and like the days of um, uh, solomon it will go back to this golden age of israel that's what the uh, messiah is going to do so there was a great expectancy that the prophet whom moses had prophesied is going to come now okay so the focus was on the kingdom of god focus was on its coming so when is it going to come so that was a common doubt people like the pharisees had that doubt the common people had that doubt so everybody was having this expectancy in their hearts that it would come soon so that's why this question came from the pharisees now some of the common people thought that uh, john the baptist was going to bring in usher in this new kingdom so that's why they they all left to their homes and went to J jordan to listen to him but then he was more interested in baptizing them and uh, you know leading them to an uh, uh, to repentance and to come back turn back to god so there was an awakening at that time mass awakening was happening during that time people were in hordes turning towards the lord they were concerned about uh, their lives they started becoming uh, you know the, the fear of the lord came to focus in their lives so you know uh, something positive was happening so that also added to the excitement that also added to the expectancy of this so john the baptist ministry was very much you know significant in that way and now jesus ministry also was gearing towards that there was such a following that nobody had seen before like this you know uh, there was huge multitudes following jesus and jesus was doing signs and wonders so the pharisees are asking this question what about the you know establishment of the kingdom of god when is the messiah going to do that so they did not believe that jesus is the messiah but they were curious to know when the kingdom would be established now the disciples would be very excited because he was going towards jerusalem see his journey was towards jerusalem so they thought that okay now when he reaches jerusalem something big is going to happen now the deliverer is going to deliver us and you know something great is over so even the pharisees asked this question all the disciples also would be tuning their ears and saying what is going jesus going to answer now is he going to say that okay within a within a few months within a few weeks you know how is jesus going to answer this question so they would all be very curious to know what the answer would be so now why did the pharisees ask this question even if they did not believe that jesus is the messiah see they had the right to ask this question because they were the custodians of the law you know they were the custodians of the law they they are the ones who learn the law and they teach the law so they if anything is outside of the law or if anything is challenging the law or misquoting the law then he has the then the pharisee has the right to ask that question say who are you what authority do you have why are you teaching like this so they had the right to ask jesus when he thought the kingdom of god would appear because jesus was teaching about the kingdom jesus seemed to be a prophet jesus seemed to be knowing what he is you know preaching so they wanted to clear this what is your stand on this what do you think about the kingdom of god when is it going to come when is it going to appear see so this was a topic that the jewish leaders discussed publicly among themselves so they expected jesus to also give them a satisfactory answer but the answer jesus gave i don't think they expected okay so Uh, Jesus gave them a very abrupt answer, nothing satisfying. But then the rest of his teaching was not at that time; it was only to the disciples. So the explanation of what he meant there to the Pharisees, he gave only to the disciples. He did not give to the Pharisees. Okay. So what did he say to the Pharisees? To the Pharisees, he said, "The kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, 'See here or see there.' For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you." Then he stopped there. then later when he was with the disciples he explained what he said to the disciples <coughs> so what does it mean when he says that the kingdom of god does not come with observation what does it mean by the word observation this word is used only here in the greek new testament okay which means to observe the future by signs okay to observe the future by signs the idea the base meaning of that word is something like spying or lying in wait okay or even researching for scientific investigation okay that's what the the root word is that has many of these meanings okay like spying on people other people uh, or uh, lying in wait for a person to come okay you're lying in wait for trapping a person or 
investigating something for research purposes, a scientific investigation. So that is all the meaning of this word observation, to observe the future by signs. So Jesus is saying, you will not see it with external signs. Why? Because the kingdom of God does not have much of a pompous outward show. You'll think that, you know, like how we have, uh, you know, these festivals and all, the grand display of light and sound and all that. No, it's not going to come like that. You will not actually recognize it from the outside signs. See, there will not be much of show. There will not be much of, you know, uh, what do you call it? Uh, sound, light and sound spectacle. You know, it won't be there. So people cannot predict its arrival. People cannot track its progress. Because there won't be any outward show for the kingdom of God. So, <clears throat> Pharisees, uh, you know, their question was correct. But it's a very sad question from the Pharisees. Now, they were ministering to the Pharisees for three years. And these men were still in spiritual darkness. They could not see that the kingdom of God was advancing right under their nose. Jesus is the king of the kingdom of God. Okay, If he is the king, he is advancing the kingdom. And it's happening right under their nose. Okay, But they are not able to see the kingdom progress. So three years they have been observing Jesus. You know, minutely studying him. But they can't see him establishing the kingdom in the lives of the people around him. See, They did not understand who Jesus is. They did not understand what he was seeking to accomplish. Their views of the kingdom were entirely political. Nothing spiritual. Okay? And they, they wanted the, uh, uh, the Messiah to focus only on the Jews, Jews and Jews. Okay? Nothing outside the Jews. But Jesus was interested in the universal. See? He was trying to reach not only the Jews but also the Gentiles. See? So, Jesus is not denying that you know, there won't be an earthly kingdom. No, there will be an earthly kingdom but that is way ahead in the future. Okay? The earthly kingdom will come, but it is way ahead in the future. But he said, what is more important is not the physical kingdom. It will come in time. But the, what is more important is the spiritual kingdom. And that is being established even now. Even now. Okay, so That's what he was trying to say. So, and then he said, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. See, it's the kingdom of God is within you. Now, the importance of the spiritual kingdom is that you can only enter the spiritual kingdom by new birth. Okay, you can't enter it by any other means. There is no citizenship like uh, you know passport or Aadhaar card or anything by which you know you can say I am a citizen of that kingdom. No, only way that you and I can enter into the kingdom of God because it's a spiritual kingdom. You can only enter it by new birth. You can only enter it by new birth. Turn with me to John chapter three, verses one to eight, when Nicodemus comes to uh, Jesus. What does Jesus say? Nicodemus comes in John chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. No one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. See how, how well the Pharisee called Nicodemus has observed Jesus. See, We know that you are a teacher come from God. Okay, no doubt about that. Now he was not, uh, you know, this was not, uh, you know, uh, impressive words. Or he was not trying to impress Jesus with these good words. Okay, but he was he he's uh, clarifying that this is how much he has studied Jesus, and this is how much he he has understood. What is he understood? He understood that Jesus, the teacher, come from God, and if God was not with him, Jesus would not be able to do these signs. So he understood that Jesus is a messenger from God. He's a prophet, and uh, God is with him. See, God is with Jesus. So Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So Jesus immediately laid down the condition. He said, unless you are born again, Nicodemus, you can't see the kingdom of God. Because he knew that is what he was coming to. That is what Nicodemus was driving towards. So immediately he, he satisfied his question with an answer. He said very clearly, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God, Nicodemus. That's what it means. See? And he doesn't say it simply. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, which means... I promise you, Nicodemus, okay, the only way you, are, you will ever enter the kingdom of God is if you are born again. Okay, If you are born again. 
Immediately, Nicodemus wanted a clarification for that. And he asked this question, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That uh, which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. Then he, he was trying to turn the focus towards how it happens. How it happens. If a birth, a human birth happens with, uh, you know, uh, water and spirit, right? The same way, uh, spiritual birth also happens with water and spirit. The Holy Spirit, but here the Holy Spirit is in charge and water of cleansing through the word of God happens. The cleansing happens with the word of God uh, and the birth happens because of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus was telling him, that unless the Holy Spirit and the Word acts upon a person, the person will not be born again. Okay. So, then he says about the wind. You know, spirit is co compared to the wind. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it. You can't see the wind, but you can see the effect of the wind. So is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. See, So it's a spiritual kingdom that Jesus was driving at. And he was telling Nicodemus clearly how a person can be born again. Now, this has already been shared. Many times Jesus has been sharing this. So the Pharisees' question is very much a sad question. Why? Because they are not able to see what Jesus is emphasizing. What is happening right under their nose? See? So they are not understanding that the important thing is the spiritual and it's not the political. So now Jesus says the statement, the kingdom of God is within you. Okay. Now this has challenged Bible interpreters. This has challenged preachers for centuries. What does it mean? And people are given so many explanations for that. Now, Jesus is not telling the unbelieving Pharisees that the kingdom of God is there inside your hearts. Okay, A person who is an unbeliever does not have the kingdom in their hearts. That's not what it means. Okay, Now, what Jesus is meaning is that for indeed the kingdom of God is among you. Okay? The kingdom of God is among you. That is what the word within actually means among. The translation actually should say among. Right? So, because the Greek word that is used there actually means both within and among or in the middle of. Okay? So, Jesus was saying, don't look for the kingdom out there. Okay? It is not somewhere far away. It is actually among you. It is actually right under your nose. That's what Jesus is actually saying. Okay? So, the fact that I am here you know, uh, uh, close to you, you know, standing next to you, is very, very important. Why? Because I am the king of the kingdom. And you can't enter the kingdom if you reject the king. How will you enter the kingdom if you say no to the king? That is what Jesus was driving at. See, the kingdom of God is right near you. It is among you, which means it's right under your nose. But you can't enter the kingdom. Why? Because you are rejecting the king. If you reject the king of the kingdom, you can't enter into the kingdom. The Pharisees, you know, they were so preoccupied with great events that are going to come in the future. But they were ignoring, they were missing out the right important event, the opportunity that God was giving them right then and there. You see? So that's the difference. Okay? So uh, turn with me to Luke 19. You'll get an idea of that. Luke 19, verse 38 to 40. Luke 19, verse 38 to 40. Right. Um, yeah, uh, 38 by saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you, if the, that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. See, the Pharisees were offended when, um, you know, the disciples called him king. The disciples called him uh, you know, uh, the uh, the highest, you know. So they said, you're only a teacher. You should actually rebuke them because they are comparing yourself to the Messiah. They're comparing yourself with the Lord. You see? So Jesus said, if I tell them to keep quiet, even the stones will cry out. So the in the heart of the Pharisee, he would say, yes, I identify that you're a messenger from God. I can see that you do signs and wonders, that God is with you, but I cannot acknowledge the fact that you are the Messiah. I will never acknowledge the fact that you are the living God come down. 
so he would never accept that and jesus was saying unless you accept me you have no part in the kingdom you have no part in the kingdom you see so they were looking out for the future and saying okay something great is going to happen in the future jesus said no 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 something great is going to happen then you know but right now something great is happening it's happening right among you it's happening right near you it's even happening right under your nose you are not able to see it you are not able to identify it why because you have already rejected the king you are rejecting me so you can't see it you can't be a part of it then that then he turns his attention to the disciples so then he is going to explain to them about the coming of the kingdom now jesus knew that you know once he leaves them these people are going to be very anxious about his second coming they going to anxious they're going to be so anxious that they're going to stop doing all their work and they're going to do nothing but you know try to track him down try to find out you know when is he coming you know they're going to be preoccupied with that and i see now you know in the churches many people are concerned about that you know they want to see the signs and wonders and they say oh is a sign that sign so does it mean that jesus is coming now or that sign okay that means that you know are we there yet you know i i remember seeing this movie you know where uh, a father uh, and mother you know take two of the children three of the children for a uh, uh, their uh, parents house you know grandparents house so they are taking these three children who don't want to travel but you know it's almost 100 100 miles so they are going by car and the father is driving and as immediately as they get into the car and start the car they are not left their house you know it's 100 miles to the grandparents house immediately as they start the car the the first child starts asking are we there yet and the father said hey let me at least get out of the you know compound you know we are in our own house near the car shed so let me take the car to the road at least man and then you know every 10 minutes they keep asking the question are we there yet are we there yet are we there yet and finally you know they reach the house and the class father shouts and says yes we are there yet there is so many christians in churches who are concerned about his second coming that they stop working see, doing what god wants them to do and they only they are preoccupied and obsessed with his second coming so much that you know they are not eagerly expecting his coming but they actually want to know the signs you know they want to see the signs and wonders of okay is this connected to that is this connected to that? so that's an obsession within the hearts of disciples also when jesus is going to leave them they are going to be so preoccupied with his going that they are going to uh, you know obsessively wait for his coming without doing any of the work that god has wanted them to do okay so they'll be trying to track him down uh, they'll be you know um, they'll not be doing the work that god wants them to do so he's going to warn them why because he wants them to keep working he wants them to continue the work that he started among them see so it's a good warning to us believers because many of us are so preoccupied with the second coming that we keep on studying only the prophecy 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 and of course we should look for his return we should wait for him we should long to see him but at the same time we should be busy doing what god has entrusted us to do we are called unto good works and we are not doing the good works we are not fulfilling the purpose for which god has saved us god has left us here for the time being see so we should be faithful in doing what god wants us to do turn with me to the book of acts now we did study acts earlier but i'm going to just look at that okay acts chapter 1 and verse 6 onwards acts chapter 1 verse 6 onwards therefore when they heard when they had come together they asked him saying lord will you at this time restore the kingdom to israel and he said to them it is not for you to know times or seasons which the father has put in his own authority but you shall receive power when the holy spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in jerusalem and in all judea and samaria and unto the ends of the earth see so we are so preoccupied with times and seasons that we stop with being witnesses of jesus you see you get what i'm trying to say so there is an obsession with prophecy there is an obsession with fulfillments and there is an obsession for times and seasons and people stop witnessing for the lord people stop living a fruitful life here on earth see so when the holy spirit has come upon us we become powerful witnesses but where are the powerful witnesses now in the church the church is more preoccupied with uh, prophecies so and the church is preoccupied you know saying that okay now uh, officially we are declaring that that his coming is close everybody knows that his coming is close we have to be prepared 
by doing the work that God has entrusted us to. And same thing happened when Jesus ascended. Next passage says, disciples are still standing there, you know, watching, thinking that you know, he'll come any moment. And then God has to send two angels to tell them, why are you guys looking up and, you know, spraining your neck? Go do what he has asked you to do. Go to Jerusalem and wait upon him. And then the disciples leave the Mount of Olives and they go to the upper room and they wait. And the Holy Spirit comes upon them and everything changes. See? So we, I, feel, I see most of the people, you know, craning their neck upward and looking up, saying, today the Lord is going to come, today Lord. So they don't do the work that God has asked them to do. So, first thing he says about his coming is that, now, you know, the days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man and you will not see it. They will say to you, look here, look there, do not go after them or follow them. For as lightning that flashes out on one part under heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. Which means his coming is going to impact the whole world. Okay, so it is foolish for people to follow false prophets and false teachers who say, hey, he's there, he's in this place. He is in that place, he is in that church, he is in this group. See, So everybody will flock to there and think, oh, there is something happening there. Jesus come there, so we will go there. No? So everybody mass movement towards that one. I think, uh, you know, recently I saw on YouTube that, you know, there is some um, revival happening in some place and all that. And people are going there, you know, taking, f booking flights and all. We're going to see what's happening in that church, you know. And everybody is moving towards Canada and, you know, some place like that. Where, the, where they say the revival is happening. And they want to see the revival and they want to be part of that. And of course, something might be happening there. But that's not, that's not where the kingdom of God is. The kingdom of God is within you and me. It is right where we are. See? So are we, are we living the kingdom here? No. We want to go there and see if Jesus is there. See? So Jesus is trying to tell us a warning. You know, he's saying, uh, be careful. Okay? Some false teachers are going to teach you that. That it is there. It is here. Don't go there. Don't go looking for the kingdom there. See? That's not where the kingdom is. So, his coming is going to impact the whole world. Reason number one. Second thing is, his coming will be suddenly like a flash of lightning. You won't even have time to book your ticket. Before that, he'll, he'll come. Okay? So, study of prophecy and scripture will help us to understand the, what do you call that, the the characteristics of the time of his coming. Okay? But we can't ever know the day or the hour of his coming. We can't know it. So it is it is a wasted effort if we go on, you know, investigating the signs, trying to calculate the day of his coming. You know, some people say, oh, he's coming on Sundays, he's coming on Monday, you know. All these things are not going to happen. Why? Because he's going to come on a time when you least expect it. Okay? So, as the lightning flashes, it is going to impact the whole world and it's going to come so suddenly like lightning that you and I won't even have time to respond in any other way. Okay? That's what Jesus is trying to tell us. So, two things that Jesus compares uh, to the lightning okay? that is coming is going to impact the whole world and it's going to affect uh, you suddenly, you know, unexpectedly. So, it's very, it's a waste of time if you're going to investigate and uh, you know, uh, just study prophecy so that you'll know which day and which hour is going to come. In fact, Jesus himself has confessed to the disciples that he doesn't know. When he was on, on the earth, disciples asked this question and he said, even I don't know. Only the Father knows when is that day. Okay. So, why, why would the Son reveal it to us now? If his own disciples are kept in the dark when he was alive, why would he reveal to us that day now? So, Jesus is not going to tell us the day and the time of his Coming. He's not going to tell any of the followers which day of his coming or not. Okay, so then it is few. It's a wasted exercise that we investigated. Then Jesus uses two Old Testament events to illustrate the certainty and the suddenness. Okay, so he said, certainly it's going to come and impact the whole world, and suddenly it's going to come and impact the whole world. And two Old Testament events are quoted here to compare this time with that. First one is the flood. Genesis chapter 6 to chapter 8, you'll find God speaking to Noah and Noah and his family believing God's word and acting upon it. By faith, Noah built the ark. By faith, Noah and his uh, family entered the ark. By faith, Noah was saved by God through the 
uh, flood. You know? So the first one is the flood. And the second one is Genesis chapter 19, destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now in both the examples that Jesus said, the people were having the common activities like eating and drinking and marrying and buying and selling. Okay, eating, drinking, uh, marrying, buying and selling. What what do you what does Jesus mean by that? Is it wrong to you know eat and drink and uh, buy and marry and all that? No, this is the common thing. This is an everyday routine thing of every human being. Okay, we are here on earth for doing these mundane routine things. Drinking, eating, marrying, buying and selling. Okay? That's that's what life is here on earth. Right? So these are the basic activities. These are everyday activities here on earth. But people are go, going to be so caught up in the everyday activities like eating and drinking and marrying and buying and selling that they are going to be unprepared for the coming of the Lord. You see? For the coming of the Lord. Now, that's what happened during the time of Noah. The judgment was coming and they were doing the same thing. Noah was building the ark. He was preaching to the unrighteous generation. But they were eating, drinking, marrying, buying and selling. His preaching did not convert a single person. His, his preaching did not save anybody. But Noah and his wife, his three sons and their wives, only the Bible says eight people was saved from that flood. Why? Because they entered the ark. So, Peter also saw this as an illustration of salvation. See, Christians have salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. You know, First Peter, uh, turn with me to First Peter. Yeah, First Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3 verse 18 onwards. First Peter chapter 3 verse 18 onwards. For Christ also suffered once for sin, the, un the unjust for sins, the un just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few... That is, eight souls were saved through water. There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism. See, what, what does he mean? What he means is, you know, I'll just explain to you because uh, I was doing this for the Genesis study in, uh, in another class, okay? So, what he means is that, you know, the ark which Noah built, it went through the flood, okay? It went through the flood and it suffered the whole storm Okay. It withstood the whole storm, it endured the whole storm and it was baptized. In baptism, Jesus says that I have to go through a baptism and that baptism was his cross and his death. Okay, So the ark went through all that baptism okay. and the people inside the ark were safe. Okay. People inside the ark were safe. So he's saying that is the antitype. Christ went through the suffering on the cross, the baptism. The people who are in Christ are saved. That's how he saves us. That's what Peter is trying to say. Okay, Not the removal of filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven. So the uh, ark went through the floods and it came out of the flood. No? The same way Jesus died and he came out. He came back to life. So in Christ, a person who is there inside the ark, is saved. That's what he's, Peter's trying to say, you know, who has gone into heaven and is the right hand of God, angels and authority, power having been made subject to him. So, if you and I are in Christ, just like the ark is an antitype of Christ, if you are like Noah in Christ, his death and his resurrection will benefit you. You and I will be saved. He went through the suffering and he died. He went through the storm and came out of the storm, kept the people inside alive. The same way if you and I are in Christ, we will be kept safe. That's what Peter is trying to say in that. He used the same illustration of the ark. Okay, So that's what he says. Peter saw this as an illustration of the salvation Christians have through faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, this is what happens. Now, 
Second person that he illustrates is Lot. Now, Lot and Noah both lived in a time of spiritual compromise. The religion was completely compromised. There was no uh, moral growth. There was a moral decline that was happening. Okay. Very much like our present times. We talked about that, you know, just before this class also, right? So the moral decline is there everywhere. It is being seen everywhere. Today I was reading, uh, I think it is in Berlin. They have passed a resolution saying that, you know, uh, men can, wherever men can walk topless, women can also walk topless. Gender equality. Okay. So we have come to a time when you're going to see people walking bare bodied. <laughs> because if men can do it, women also can do it. So anybody can do it. So we're going to see that. And we're going to be shocked about, you know, people are going to look at you and say, why are you wearing clothes, man? You know, and th that's the moral depravity that's going to come around us. So this is the time that we are living in, right? Same like that was the time of Noah and Lot. Lawlessness was on the increase. Population growth is very, very, you know, profound. It's very, very significant. At this time, lawlessness was also increasing. Earth was given over to violence, right? That was the time of Lot and Noah. Homosexuality and all kinds of perverse things were going on around them, right? So when you look around, you see the same same reflection of that. Unnatural lust. You know, Sodom and Gomorrah was also famous for that. God detested their practices so much that you know he he said, "I have to do this." I have to do this. He was like cleansing the land of these people. Lot and his two daughters. His wife was also destroyed when she was running. You know, she turned back and looked. Again, that warning is also given there. You know, what, are, what is your heart attached to? If your heart is attached to it, then you, you lose out on what is eternal. So her heart was attached to something in, in Sodom. So he, she turned back and looked. The, the angels had warned her, no, don't turn back. Keep running forward. When you do, uh, don't turn back till you reach the hills. But before that, she turned back and she became a pillar of salt. So that also is reminded there, you know. Remember the Lord's wife. So amazing, you know, how word of you see, God has not gotten tired of these examples. Why? Because these are living examples. He's quoting them because it has happened. And he wants us to be aware of these facts that this is history. God has done this in, in the past and he will do it again. He'll do it again. See, Jesus was there when the flood was happening. He saw it. He was there saving Noah and his family. Jesus was there in Sodom and Gomorrah, sending the judgment on those people, saving Lot and his family. You see, He was there. So he could tell them. He was telling these people again. See? This happened. This happened. So, only Lot and his two daughters escaped from that place. So, if you look at verse 30 onwards, you'll find that what is going to happen when Jesus Christ returns in judgment? He's going to defeat his enemies and he's going to establish his kingdom on earth. You'll find the same thing in Revelation chapter 19. When Jesus Christ returns, what happens? 19 and 20 gives you details. After Jesus' second coming, what happens? So, believers have enough from the Bible itself to take this warning. Why should we go looking for signs outside? Israel is a living example right in front of us. Right? At this end of the age, what is going to happen to Israel also, Bible says clearly. As long as that doesn't happen, we know we are not there in the end times yet. End times of the end times, we are not reached there. We haven't reached the tribulation unless the man of uh, you know lawlessness has been revealed. We know that this hasn't happened. Unless the rapture has happened, we know. It has not begun. The, the uh, uh, you know, uh, tribulation has not yet begun. So we have enough and more clarity on that from the scriptures itself. We can see it. God has given us enough warnings. See? So when he comes in the clouds, the church is going to be taken to the heavens. It will happen in a moment, the Bible says. In a twinkling of an eye, says 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Right? In a moment, in a twinkling of the eye, the people will be translated. They will be taken up to heaven, right? So nobody who is going to be part of the rapture needs to be worrying about the Lord's return on the earth. No, we don't have to be concerned about that. That is going to happen beyond the rapture. So our concern should be the rapture. See? His 
trumpet sound he is appearing in the clouds we should be there that's all second coming is not our issue if you are a believer right? if you have been raptured then second coming we're going to come victorious with him with the host of angels you know we're going to come prepared for the final war see so our concern is not to be the second coming our concern is more about how we will be found when he comes to pick us up from the rapture right so this is a sign from heaven so some people will try to you know hurry home so that they can save something like lot's wife you know? they can save a microwave or they can save a house or they can save a car or they can save a relationship cannot happen see remember lot's wife she lost okay she lost so the the person whose heart is attached to things of the earth he will lose he will lose okay now understand that the verb that is used here taken when okay the word taken one will be left and the other will be taken the taken does not mean taken to heaven when the lord comes second time okay which is actually his second coming that's the coming of his judgment one will be taken to judgment and the other one will be left so the person who is left is the believer the believer enters the kingdom of god noah and his family were left to enjoy the new beginning that god started okay the whole population of earth was taken in the flood same way if you look at sodom and gomora lot and his daughters were left alive when sodom and gomora were taken when the fire and brimstone came and hit them they were taken off from the map you know? sodom and gomora were removed see so on that day when the lord comes one will be taken for judgment the other will be left the other one who is left is the believer the one who is taken is taken for judgment okay so then he speaks about the night also so uh he says uh, the other way, two women will be grinding together two will be left in the field right uh what was that um uh, he says something about the night also yeah i tell you in the in that night there will be two men in one bed and one will be taken and the other will be left uh one verse there is night and the other verse there is day okay now why does that happen i was <laughs> when i was studying this you know then it, i remember that it's actually impacting the whole world you see so jesus is saying it's not going to be in one place if uh, if in israel god is coming in night then it can't be day again in israel because it's going to happen in a twinkling of an eye it's going to be a second right but that second in one place on the earth it will be day another place on the earth will be night so he's coming at the same moment when he's coming to israel if it's night another part of the earth it's day so it will also impact them also okay so everyone around the world will be somehow involved with the return of jesus christ he is going to come in glory one group who are believers will join him in glory but the other group who are rejectors or rebels they will be taken for judgment revelation chapter 1 and verse 7 says behold he comes in the clouds and every eye will see him every person on all all parts of the globe they will see him they will see him see so G- disciples are hearing for the third time you know jesus saying about taken and left so they asked him the logical question said where lord you know, where are they going to be taken so then jesus replies where are they going to be taken they are going to be taken for they are going to be made a feast for the birds okay eagles and vultures are the birds that gorge on dead bodies on corpses okay they are the ones who eat waste right so there is going to be a massive massive butchering that's going to take place that's the last battle in revelation called the armageddon right in that battle the enemies of christ is going to be laid as corpses they're going to be finished off there and the birds are going to feast on that and jesus is going to prophesy that he says wherever the body is there they they're going to be taken to to be made bodies okay they're going to be taken to be made corpses and a feast is going to be arranged for the birds of the air and they're going to come and gorge on the flesh of jesus enemies okay so jesus is going to come second time to judge his enemies 
So where are the Pharisees going to be? That's why Jesus did not explain this so clearly to the Pharisees. Why? Because they, 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 they know that's what's going to happen. Because they've rejected the king, they're going to be his enemies. And so these enemies are going to be there, laid bare on that day as corpses, you see. So they are going to be taken for judgment and the rest of the people who are left behind, they're going to be saved. So this is the understanding that the uh, disciples got. Pharisees, they were warned. They said, right under your nose, the kingdom of God is advancing. So as we look to him this evening, let us not be obsessed with the day and time of his hour of his coming. That's not our prerogative. Our prerogative is to see that you know we are faithful in doing our work when the Lord appears in the clouds and we hear the trumpet sound. Only the believers will hear the trumpet sound. In the twinkling of an eye, we are going to be translated. We are going to be transformed into Christ-like bodies. You know? And we are going to be caught up into the clouds. Then we are going to come with him only in the second coming. That's after seven years. Okay, So seven years, we are going to be missed from the earth. People are going to notice that you are missing from the earth. See? Why? Because you have put your faith in Jesus Christ. And he has translated you out of this earth. Seven years, there is going to be great tribulation here on earth. And people are going to curse those days when they were left here. And then Jesus is going to appear to finish off his enemies. At that time, we will be coming with him. And the rest of the people who rebelled against him, they will be rotting corpses here. Mm -hmm. So this is the place where the vultures are going to feast. So let's thank God. If you are saved today, let's thank God. If you are not saved today, this is again a warning for us. You know, that we should be saved today. Don't wait for tomorrow. Tomorrow may never come because suddenly, tonight, if you hear the trumpet sound and the rest of the people are translated, we will be left behind here you know, for the suffering of the tribulation. Why would you be wanting to you know, suffer unnecessarily for the wrong sake? And here Jesus says, for those who were in the ark were already saved. Noah and his family were safe. Lot and his daughters were safe. You and I, if you put your trust in Jesus Christ, he will take you through the storm. You will be safe in the tribulation. And that's a promise that he gives us. So let us be prepared for his coming. Let us be prepared for his coming. Let's not be ignorant. Yes, Jesus is going to come soon. How prepared are we? Are we faithfully doing the work that he has called us to do? So the four marks of a Christian are, first of all, forgiveness. We should be forgiving others like how Jesus forgave us. Second, we should be faithful, doing the work that God has commanded us every day, daily. Thirdly, we should be thankful people, remembering things that God has blessed us with, with thankfulness, gratitude in our hearts. A person who is ungrateful in his heart, he is laying a heart which is ripe for sin. Fourth mark of a Christian is being prepared for his coming. Are you eagerly doing the work that God has entrusted you? Would God see you as a faithful worker when he comes? Are you ready to hear the trumpet sound today? If he comes in the clouds, that shows how prepared you are. So let's focus on him and let's focus on his words. In Jesus' name, let's pray. Gracious and loving Father, we thank you that your word is direct. And the word keeps on reminding us things from the Old Testament, where you dealt with people. The whole multitude of people who died in the flood, God is reminding us. The whole multitude of people around us are perishing. But God does not want a single person to perish. But he wants everyone to be saved and come to the knowledge of his salvation through Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, many are not going to do that. They are going to die and they are going to perish. Lord, we pray that none of us who hear this message today are going to perish, O oh Lord. But we will put our faith in Jesus Christ and would be saved. Just like how Noah and his family were saved in the ark, Jesus would save us today. Help us, O Lord, to take the warning from the Old Testament and to be prepared today. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, Amen.